Hello there, and welcome back to my workshop. In this video, I'm going to be trying to repair a battery damaged 286 motherboard that I brought off eBay last year. It sat in the corner for a while, and I thought it was time to get it working. Can I do that? Let's find out. I was looking for something to follow on from the Acid Atari series. That was a very popular video, and I was really struggling with what to do next. So I searched around and I found this 286 board on eBay. I don't have the full details, just this picture. It was listed as an MG Endland 286 board, faulty with a question mark. So I decided to buy it. As soon as I brought it, I had a look around for some kind of manual or instructions based on the title, but I couldn't really find a lot. And I looked on Vogons and a few other places, and they did have a list of boards that use a certain type of chipset. So the chipset used on this board is a headland, hence the MG headland. And it's a 102-103 chipset. I did find the actual data sheet for the chipset that was a help, but I wasn't able to find an exact manual for this board or even a picture of this board. I found this one that was very close, the battery's in a different place, and this one has dip switches. Mine didn't have dip switches, but most things are there. There were quite a few other boards that were very similar, but none of them were an exact match. This didn't have an actual manual for it. It just had like a generic 286 manual. On top of that, I found this PDF, which is a, like a generic 286 service manual. So it did have some schematics. It had block diagrams, basic layouts. My initial testing didn't really show much. It wasn't doing anything. And what I decided to do was remove some of the chips. So as you can see here, I have removed these two small chips at the top, I removed the battery, and I removed the keyboard controller. This then allowed me to do an inspection underneath those, and we could see what was going on. But at this time, I think I just had enough of doing this kind of work after the Acid Atari series. It was just so epic. And also work was starting to get really, really busy. I didn't have the time that I would like to spend on it. So I just put it away. It went in a storage bin until recently. A few weeks before this video came out, I watched a video from Adrian, Adrian Black, in his digital basement. And he was preparing a 286 board. And I thought, yeah, after watching him do it, I could apply the same techniques. So I decided to get it out, and that was a few weeks ago. Let's take a closer look at this 286 board. Like I said, it's slightly different to any pictures that I could find, especially the battery location and the fact that it doesn't have dip switches. Everything else was quite similar to one, so that was my reference. The chipset is the Headland GC102, and this is made up of three chips. The 101 is a peripheral controller, and then the 102 is split with a data buffer and address buffer chips. We have four banks of dip RAM. This can be 256K or one megabit DRAM, and it does support zero weight state if the RAM is 80 nanoseconds or faster. The BIOS is from Quadtel. I wasn't sure if it worked, so I did burn some new ones, but I have gone back to the original ones. Now we get to the section with the corrosion, and as I've mentioned, I have removed the keyboard connector, the battery, the two smaller ICs, and the keyboard controller. On the back, it doesn't look too bad. Most of the damage is around the vias. It still needs a lot of work to check all of those and all the traces. My first task is to go all over the traces and vias and make notes. I did start with pictures and a pen, but I quickly progressed to doing it digitally. You can see here, I have the top layer, and then I can overlay the traces in yellow. I lined up the picture of the bottom layer, and now I can put the top and bottom together, and we can see all of the traces. This was really helpful, and I did carry on doing this in all the other areas as well. So I'm going to carry on, and I start with the two smaller ICs and I clean up the pads the normal way with flux and solder, and then I'm using the excellent engineered desolder tool, the best desoldering tool ever. I then start to make notes of the traces and vias, especially any that run under ICs before installing new sockets. Follow the traces over to the keyboard controller, check continuity, and then clean up the vias with an acupuncture needle. It's also very handy to push through to see the spot on the other side of the board or to use it with a multimeter, you can grip onto it. Once all these are cleaned, documented, I clean up the second smaller IC and repeat the processes of checking and documenting all the traces and vias. 
Eventually, I install a second socket and we can move on to the keyboard controller area. Just like before, clean up all the pads, new solder, flux, desolder gun, and what we are left with is nice shiny pads, no sign of any corrosion. While we're doing this, I noticed some darker pads and legs on the real time clock, so I decide this has to be removed, and it would give me a chance to follow any traces that run underneath it. I did the normal method with the desolder tool, but it was being a bit stubborn, so I do move on to using the hot air station. I used Captain tape on the top to, to protect the surrounding chips and the plastic connectors. It doesn't take too long to soften the solder on the top, and I can remove the RTC chip with no damage. Then I follow this up with the usual flux solder so much solder and flux, and then clean up, again leaving nice clean pads, no sign of any corrosion. That will really make it difficult to put new solder back onto the board. The pads, traces and veers are all tested, and any that need work are documented. I move on to installing a socket before the final inspection of the keyboard section. Checking the veers with the acupuncture needle, and I think that's it. We can make a start on installing the bodge wires and joining up all of those damaged traces. I'm using some old Kynar 30 AWG wire. I've had it for years and it gets a bit messy when you get a lot of bodge wires. So later I will change this, but I just wanted to get this booting. These are fixing traces that run underneath those two chips or going in front of the battery, the heavy corroded section around the keyboard controller. I couldn't see some of the traces for the keyboard input output lines. So I decided to remove these two ceramic caps to get a better look. It was not so easy and I did break one, but I wasn't too worried. I do have a big collection and it turns out to just be 47 Pika Farads. Now we can carry on and finish the remaining damage traces before we try to turn this on for the second time. I did try a while ago and it did nothing, but I didn't have a speaker and it didn't have a postcard. So fingers crossed this is going to fix something. Before we turn it on, I want to quickly check those two smaller logic chips. So I put them in my chip tester. It does find the first one. It is a 74HC14. And as we can see, it passes its test. Then I put in the second one, which is a 74LS06. And again, it passes its test. So those chips are both working and we can put that back into the board. So I'm fairly confident a Pico power supply to power the board. Got the post diagnostic card plugged in. We have a speaker connected up. I think it's time to try switching it on. Oh, it made a beep. It made a beep, but why does that do nothing? Been about a week since I last looked at this, but I've been doing lots of research in between. So when we last left it, we were getting three beeps. So let's power it on and we get three quick beeps. So in the meantime, I've been trying to find information about the board. And I also ordered a new power on self-test card because the last one just didn't work. I've been talking to Glenn casual retro gamer, as you might know him on YouTube. And he put out to some of the groups that he's in, asking if anybody knew anything about these boards. We were still getting generic 286 back. And then somebody found a board that was very, very close. So we have a diagram and the basic layout is the same. Position of the jumpers is the same, but the labels on the jumpers are wrong but it was close enough. Position of jumpers is there, the type of memory in between the ISA sockets and the position of the chips along the bottom. Position of the jumpers all match up. It's just that the labels on the silk screen is different. So that was very good. We also have a diagram, which I'll put on the screen, which is telling us the configurations for the banks when we put our memory in. We also have a diagram showing the type of memory and what banks they need to go in. And then all of the other jumpers dotted around the board. So we'll, have, we'll look at that in a second. So now that we've got that information, we can go to the next step.
We also have the PC analyzer with the booklet. So let's quickly look at some of the jumpers on the board. And to be fair, as it came, it's pretty much set up correctly. So in this section here, this is for the parity. This one sets up the coprocessor to run off the internal clock or its own clock, uh, but it doesn't actually have a crystal just there. This sets the size of the EEPROMs. On the instructions, we should have a dip switch just there, uh, but these are very basic things like the type of screen that's used, monitor type, color or monochrome, shadow RAM enabled, disabled, bus speed, fast or slow. And it looks like it's set on the second to last, which is shadow RAM enabled or disabled. There's also this jumper position just there, but it doesn't actually have a jumper on and it's not closed. But all of, all of those look okay. Then if, as we look around this section, we have memory bank 0, bank 1, 2 and 3. And then these are the positions for the parity chips. So I have put in some 41256 parity chips, which I hope would fix it. Up here we have the two chips to select what banks the memory are in and then the turbo LED, the turbo switch. And then this section is a speaker and reset. So the instructions talk about putting these in the various positions to choose from the banks. It starts with this pin as pin one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the instructions say for banks naught and one, we should be in two and three, five and six, eight and nine, which we are. If it was in one and two and the opposite side, then it would be moving across to the SIP memory. So again, I'm happy that these are in the correct position. So the thing that was throwing me off was the three beeps that we were getting from the speaker. So let's put the post diagnostic card in and see what happens. So I'm just gonna put it on its side so that you can see the codes. So we're turning it on with the memory installed. And our last code is 22. We can hold this button down and flick through the codes. So I did do that and I made a note of all of the codes going all the way back to the beginning. Just out of interest, I removed the first chip. So now it should be giving us a memory error. So if we turn on now, we get a different code, 1C0080, and it's repeating over and over. So the board is definitely acknowledging that I've removed the memory chip. So I started to, to look through the book, and the book in the back had a list of beeps, and it says three beeps, base memory error, but that's for AMI BIOS. If we looked at the other types, Phoenix, these have all got like one beep, two beeps, three beeps. AMI BIOS, two short, one long. Award BIOS, one short, two short. So they all have different length beeps, but this one just has beep, 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 three short beeps. So that was why I thought it was a memory problem. If we look at some of the codes that we're getting, so we were, we were finishing on 22. 22, initialize slot two for award. Nothing for AMI. Test keyboard for Phoenix, but we know we don't have Phoenix. 1C is reserved for award. Nothing for AMI. Reset programmable interrupt controller for Phoenix. So none of the codes that I was getting was really making any sense. So then I decided to look on the internet and this is what I found. So we can see that we've got an AMI BIOS, award BIOS, there's quite a few others. And then they do have a section for Quadtel and that's what's in here, it's Quadtel BIOS. And again, there's a couple of different versions of the Quadtel BIOS. But one of them made sense when we looked at it as how it was working. So the last code that we got when it was, the memory was in was 22. And on this version, 22 is keyboard controller, which is missing on this board because I need to put it back on. And then when we tested it without memory, the last code was 1C. And 1C 
is a basic memory test. So it failed because of the memory. And then it was repeating and testing and testing. So based on that, I'm going to use the Quadtel postcodes to do the rest. And if we look through the two power on sequences, we can see that they get, all get to the similar point and then it diverges because it's not got the memory and then it goes past the memory and we get to keyboard controller. So based on all the information that I've gathered this week, we've got a close enough match with the jumpers to think that they're all in the correct spot. Post diagnostic card giving us a list of codes which we then matched to the information on the website. That says it's passing the memory, the memory is okay, and it's getting stuck at the keyboard controller. So this is the section of the board that took most of the damage. And as you can see, I've removed the keyboard controller. It's just here. And we need to do some repair work. Part of my research this week was looking at the manuals that I did have. And they were all saying that these Headland chipsets use a basic Intel keyboard controller or a clone of it. So I managed to find the pinout for the keyboard controller and a list of what the signals do. So my next step is to measure what all of these pins are doing on the board with my scope and compare them to what we should be seeing on this information sheet, marking off the pins that are not doing anything and then checking on the board to see if they've got a damaged track. I then have new sockets one by one, repair the damaged track, put the socket in and then we can use that to run wire mods and then we can then probe the points again before we put the chip back in and see if our post test gets any further. There's still a chance that this chip doesn't work, but I think that's the next step. With the scope set up, I make a start looking for activity on the pads of the keyboard controller. It was a good idea, but I didn't think about the signals that the controller would generate, and these are going to be missing. The first two signals that I expected to see are the x tile inputs for the clock. I thought this was sent to the controller, but I was wrong. It's generated by it, so I'm not going to see them without the chip. But it didn't matter. It was enough to make me take notes and check for damage later on. I move on to the rest of this side, the first 20 pins. I find another problem that led me down a false path. This chip has pinouts called test, and it says that they're not used, but clearly my board is using them because I have activity on them. It turns out that these are the inputs for the keyboard connector, and I later find a better data sheet, one that matches my board, and they're marked as TO and T1, and it says that they are for data and clock inputs. After checking the rest of the first 20 pins, I can see that it has all the signals coming from the chipset, CPU, so chip select, read write, and the data pins. They all have activity. I move on to pins 21 to 40. Most of these are not used. This is a programmable IO chip, so it has many inputs and outputs. Eventually, I get to a group that have labels, and I start to check these signals, and I can see a few problems, so I make notes. Combined with the newer data sheet, things start to make sense, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So I'll go back to what I found. The main problem that I can see is the missing clock signals from the crystal. I tried to get a reading by inserting the controller chip into the board without soldering it, just holding it in place. And again, the clock signals are missing. So I decided to look closer at the traces. After removing the ceramic caps, I can see the traces a lot clearer. And I test and confirm that the traces going to pins two and three, the XL, are actually missing. We eventually get to installing the new socket. Uh, sorry, it's a bit dark there. And then I can start to install the bodge wires that I know about, mainly the ones for the clock and a few others that I think are missing. So I think this is going to be enough to get the chip to actually do something. So we'll get set back up again and we will try starting it up. Okay, we have our post card in. So we've definitely gone past the point that we did before and I think we should connect up a graphics card. Right, plugged in my graphics card. Okay. 
Hasn't beeped yet. Two beeps. Does it like that? So I need to get a monitor rigged up. All right, let's get a monitor rigged up. All right, guys, so got the board connected up. I've changed, I found another power supply so we can run the monitor. We're plugged into VGA. Keyboard isn't connected up still, but the keyboard controller is connected up. So let's switch it on. So we have a flash and we have a display. Quartel BIOS, 640k system ran past, CMOS checks on bad run set up, real time clock error, disk drive A error, press F1 to resume or F2 to set up. That is awesome. So that is absolutely awesome. Still got a lot to fix, but we've got it booting. That is definitely a step in the right direction. So the next step will definitely be finishing off the traces around the keyboard. I'm guessing the clock's bad because it needs the battery and the time setting up. So yeah, it will be finishing off the repairs around the keyboard thing, but I'm so happy with that progress. It is amazing. It is absolutely amazing compared to what we had at the start of the day. So I think that was a good a point to end this first part as any. We did quite a lot of work there. It was actually an insane amount of work that I did in the background and I condensed it all down to what I think is a nice entertaining package rather than listening to me swear and grumble and have no idea what I'm doing because I'm using the wrong keyboard controller pinouts. Part two, we will carry on with the keyboard and we do have those better instructions and it really helps. I ordered an IDE floppy controller, so we will try to get that working. And I've also got an XT IDE that I took out of the 8088. So we've got a few options to try and get some programs running on this old 286 board. So see you in part two, like and subscribe and all of that. And I'll see you very soon.